Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your grace. Lord, I pray that my tongue would be as the pen of a ready writer to write upon the hearts of men, God. And Lord, use me as your vessel, Lord, but remove me from the process of my thoughts and my intellect and my injections. But Lord, may the words that I speak come from your throne room. May they edify you. May they lift you up. May they honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Today, we are entering into a new series called A Child of God. A Child of God. Now, I know that it's not like a bumper sticker. I know it's not like a meme or something that you're just going to send out like, whoa, pastor preached on and being a child of God. But it, I think it's so powerful that it is overlooked because so much of our identity as a child and God being our Heavenly Father determines our success in life. It determines our forward progress. It determines our identity. It determines the provision in our life. It determines the protection in our life. Our identity with our Heavenly Father really determines so much in our lives. And what happens, though, is many people have had, had strained relationships with their earthly fathers. Earthly fathers, we know, are flawed, even the best of them, right? I'm flawed as a father. I've not made every decision right. I've not handled everything right. I've not responded in all the right ways. Now, we can make those things right when we ask our kids for forgiveness, that means we can apologize to our kids. Son, I'm, I apologize. I don't like to say I'm sorry, but I apologize. That's why it's so hard sometimes for the flesh to ask for forgiveness, you know, with my wife and stuff like that. It's easy to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry means I feel bad that you feel bad, but too bad. Right? That's, that's what really I sorry, I'm sorry means. But I apologize acknowledges I was wrong not just that I was wrong, but I'm going to make a change so that I don't repeat this over and over. Okay? And so we've had bad experiences with early fathers, maybe an absentee father. You're dealing with an abandonment. Maybe, maybe an abusive father. Physically abusive, or maybe it's just verbally abusive. Just the most vile, wicked things come out of your dad's mouth, and that is affecting your heart. It is punching you straight in your heart, and, and, and it's affecting your identity because what, who you see in Christ conflicts on what your earthly father is telling you. And so we have this conflict in us. We come to church and we hear about, I'm a child of God, and this is my identity, and this is my strength, and then we hear our earthly father tear all of that back down. And this is where you need to put in great protections in your life. See, Numbers tells us this in Numbers 14, 18. He lays the sins of the parents upon the children. Their entire family is affected, even the children to the third and fourth generation. Now, this is Old Testament. Okay, this is Old Covenant. It doesn't mean that it's uprooted. It just means when you apply the New Covenant, you can have a different outcome. See, and some of you, you're still living Old Covenant when you see this, that you don't feel that you have a choice or an option when it comes to how you were raised and what your parents did in your life and what they said to you. Come on. Some of you are dealing with things right now as we speak, and you are broken inside. You are hurting inside. And I'm sorry, right now I'm turning the air off because I'm freezing. Anyone else freezing? Amen. We can do two things at once. We are having thermostat wars as we speak. <laughs> Ushers, leave them alone. Do not touch the sacred thing. There. You know, people aren't listening to me when they're going. <laughs> the whole Afghan division's coming back, you know. My wife brings her blankie. Let, let's just talk a little bit about the sins of the father laid against the third and fourth generations. This means that Without the intervention of the blood of Jesus Christ, there are going to be 
familial things that you receive from your father that you're going to pass on to your children and they're going to pass on to their children. We're not talking about um, heretical or genetic issues. Um, Yes, you do get your genetics from your parents, and and that's that's a different thing. The Bible is referring not to genetic issues, but to familial things. In other words, values and and traits and habits and little things that you pick up and, you know, how how dad talked to his mom. That's how other sons are being taught how to talk to their wives. Come on. Are you seeing, you know, we see patterns. Monkey see, monkey do. That's not an evolution statement. I'm just saying, kids see what parents do and what happens. They do this and then their kids see it. It's perpetuated. But thank God with the new covenant, we have the blood of Jesus that can interrupt that curse. In other words, that curse doesn't have to be carried on into you and then your children and your grandchildren. You can break it through the blood of Jesus. You can put on the mind of Christ. You can see with the word of God, you can look into that mirror and say, this is what I'm supposed to look like. I don't care what my earthly father says about me because if my earthly father contradicts my heavenly father, it's a lie. So the beautiful thing is, is you may not be perfect, believe it or not. I know, truth hurts sometimes, but we are not perfect individuals. But when you come to Christ, you have the ability for Christ to work in you to perfect you. Not make you perfect, but to perfect you. You won't be perfect until you stand before God and he says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Come on in. Right? Pick a cloud. Any cloud. (laughs) Grab a heart. If that is your picture of heaven... You got problems. If you think you're going to rest, actually, what's going to happen is you're going to get to work for the kingdom. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Fix some of your false doctrine. Amen. But, you know, when you're born again, immediately you're adopted by the Heavenly Father. You're adopted. My wife's adopted. Sometimes I thought I was adopted. Mom, Dad, I hope you're not watching. <clears throat> but no, I mean, when you're adopted, and we, we have to think, when the Bible speaks, especially in Ephesians and Galatians, talking about adoption, Romans, we're literally taking the Roman context of what adoption meant in the days of the Roman Empire because a, a son or a daughter birthed into a family could be put to death. You could put away your earthly born child. But if you adopted a child according to Roman law, you could not put them away because you chose them. Big difference. And so when God says that he adopts you, you think that you're secondhand goods. You think you're the red headed stepchild. Can I say that and not be? <laughs> can, can you say that? My sister was red and headed and a stepchild. So. That's, that's how I know it. You know, I'm speaking of fact, okay? No, I'd, no but, but if you're redhead, you, you're beautiful. You're valued. Don't send me an email, please. <laughs> no, but, but what happens is, is we think that we're secondhand goods being adopted. Like, oh, you know, okay, come on. Okay, you can come on family vacation, but you sit over there. You get different presents at Christmas, you, you see what happens when you start seeing yourself as an earthly adopted child of God rather than a kingdom adopted child of God. You have a different value system when you're looking from an earthly context. You need to be looking from a spirit context to understand that he chose you before you were born. He designed you and he chose you. You're not an accident. That's why when you know, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. The opening statement is our father. What is he doing? He's introducing you to the sonship or the daughtership of who you are in Christ. Our father. Through Jesus Christ, you get to say our father. If you relegate your father to the big man upstairs, then he's not your father. He's just a big man upstairs. But I have a heavenly father that transcends the ability of my earthly father. As good as my earthly father is and was and has been, even, you know, not being a perfect man, which we all know we're not perfect, but my heavenly father makes up for earthly imperfections. 
1 John 3, 1, you need to know this, that we should be called the children of God. Some, some people are, are literally wounded so deep with their earthly father that they have a hard time identifying as a child of God. Praise God. Yes, Lord. Just roll with it. Just roll with it. John 1, 2. He said he gave us the right to become children of God. Not just that you can be called a child of God, but you have the right. You have the access. You have the legal standing. Nobody can take that away from you except you. You're the only one that can walk away from God. In Galatians 3.26, for in Christ Jesus, you were all sons and daughters of God through faith. See, it requires your faith to be involved into, into grasping the beauty that God wants to give you, the strength that he wants to give you. And when you start thinking about this concept, this construct of, of biblical theology of understanding that we are a child of God. Say, I'm a child of God. So what that does then is it means that we are one race. Now, some people struggle with this because they want to take their color and break it into a, a race like we're different. When what Martin Luther King Jr. worked on is trying to say we're not different. That's why we don't need this and we don't need that for that. And we're the same. But now what we're dealing with is, no, no, we're different and we need to stay different and there's nothing that can change our differences and that goes against the kingdom of God teaching. We are one race. Now let me say it this way. We are one race. But we have many cultures within that race. Okay? Cultures is how you like your food. Do you like Spanish rice or white rice? Or no rice? Right? Now, we in America, we don't understand rice. We think potato. Right? But the other six billion people on the planet are like going, give me my rice. Any rice lovers? Anyone? Anyone? Bring me my carbs. Think of it this way. Galatians 3.28 says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You want, you want to hear equity? Read that scripture. We are all equally valued. Intrinsically, we are all equally valued. A human life is a human life regardless of the shade. Now, I need, I need some help. I need some shades, some different shades to come up here. Who's going to shade me up? All right? Yeah? Yeah? Come on. Come on. Come on. Where's Nui? Where's, are we serving? Yeah, come on up here. All right. All right. Oh, Chase, come on up here. You're really white. I mean, whew. so the world is trying to divide us based on the pigment shade. I want you to know that if I hung out in the sun long enough, right, next summer you'd be like, hey, bro. <laughs> right? I mean, look, we can, we, can, we can get a little darker, we can get a little lighter, Right? But, but the shade of our skin does not determine the value of who we are. Look, Acts 17, 26 said it this way. He hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. He has made everyone 
that come from Adam and Eve. So that means we are brother and sister, whether we like it or not. We, we are brother and sister, even if we are not born again. Obviously, reading the context of scripture, scripture, there are times that he's speaking specifically to Christians when he says brothers, sisters, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about legally. I'm talking about biblical doctrine, legal doctrine. We are all brothers and sisters. We are all family. We are family. All my brothers, sisters, me. Right? Right? Or umpatata, umpatata, umpatata. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so let's break this down because what you hear the school board saying around us is, oh, we're not teaching critical race theory. We're, no, CRT does not exist. That is not a part of our doctrine. That's not a part of our teaching. It's not a part of our curriculum. We are not rolling this out. Right? Little Jedi trick, right? These are not the droids you're looking for. That's, that's what's happening. Oh, and by the way, it's Zoom only. Zoom only meetings now. Hmm. Try a Zoom only wedding night, see how that goes. <laughs> I got to hurry. <clears throat> Listen, CRT has many labels, social justice, critical race theory, equity, equal outcomes, white privilege, power structure, social constructs, reparation narratives. All are not compatible with the Bible. Okay? And what I want you to know, there are <clears throat> kind of like two categories, and I want to be careful about just saying hard lines here, but let's just think in principle. There are two categories. You have, you have activists of this agenda, and then you have those that are just kind of ignorant, that are well-meaning, and are caught up in it. Okay? If you're an activist, I'm not here to talk to you. The Bible just says not to reason with a fool. Okay? <laughs> I'm not done. And the Bible says, he that says in his heart, there's no God, is a fool. So I didn't say it. God said it. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to debate or argue with you on that. But if you are confused, if you have been drawn into this, maybe you've come from a church that has been drawn into this out of naivety or, or maybe being well-meaning or maybe because they're scared to take a stand on truth, then they're still reachable. They're, they're potentially still teachable, okay? But we have churches left and right falling for the CRT and the social justice. Um, and many, many will not stand for truth, even though they know it's not truthful to teach this. They won't stand for truth because they're afraid of what will happen if they do take a stand. I'm more afraid of what will happen if we don't take a stand. Romans gives us a clear charge, Romans 16, 17, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. This is all about creating divisions, divisiveness, separating. That's how you conquer a nation. A house that is divided against itself cannot stand. This is why you have to be united with kingdom doctrine if you're going to stand. You have to be united with, with your heavenly father and thinking heavenly father thoughts about yourself and about other people. Now, we, I'm sure all know this quote by Martin, Martin Luther King Jr., but I want to speak to it. He says, I look to a day when people will not be judged by the color of their skin but the character of their content. And unfortunately, we've seen a role reversal that now we are being judged by the color of our skin. But see, that's only the entry way. That's the, that's the segue. That's the entrance to really the, the true agenda. That it's nothing to do really ultimately about the color of skin, but it's about sexual preference. That's what it's about. See, they're teaching segregation doctrine. And in order to teach segregation doctrine, you can't be tied to anyone's character. Because if you're going to have integrity and character, you can't flip-flop. You can't speak against the things that you said last year. You can't change the narrative. 
And see, this is why sometimes we feel like we're at a disadvantage. You know, I remember when I was in sales years ago, um, I, I, just, I just understood that I was not going to win every sale, even though I had the better product and the better system. I just knew I wasn't because I couldn't lie about what we were going to do. But my competitors could. And so this is, this is the advantage, what we see right now of the left, is that they have no boundaries. They have no rules by which they have to play by. So really what this is about, though, it's about dealing with the most dominant group, the group that is the most dominant in uh, creating the values of society, okay? And if we look at, at, at really the most dominant values that have been in America that has brought us to where we're at up to about eight years ago or more is the dominant values of Judeo-Christian values, by which the Constitution was founded on, by which our judicial system is supposed to operate on, the Ten Commandments. Come on. That's been the most dominant system. But if, you, if you're going to come out with an opposing doctrine, you have to remove that dominant system that is in charge. All right? And, and so what they do is, is they try to tell us that we're intolerant. Okay? We're intolerant. Our, our beliefs are intolerant. Well, let me just say that the values of God are unchangeable. If you view that as intolerant, I can't help that. Right. Truth is truth. What two people want to do in a, in a room by themselves, that's up to them if they're consenting adults. Right? I can't control that, and I'm not going to try to control that. But we shouldn't change our laws to make our values wrong and their values legal. Right. Look, I've traveled to... The Muslim countries, I've traveled to the Hindu countries, I've traveled to the countries of Buddhism, I've traveled to the three most intolerant religions on the planet. They kill people still. I don't know if you know that. These religions still kill people that stand against them. They put them in prison. They do away with them. Okay? And you know what? People have done things in the name of Christianity in the past, in years past. It doesn't mean that it was Christian. It doesn't mean it was godly. But what they have to do is they have to demonize biblical values in order to remove us as the dominant group. Why? Because we have been the most dominant group in government, in schools, in the courts, in the homes. And, and the most dominant group, they want to remove us. Why? Because we're the haves and they're the have-nots. And so, therefore, you need, to, you need to take from them because they feel that we have something that has been wrongfully taken. I didn't know that working for something and applying your, your, your skills to something is wrong. And the last I checked, the Bible still believes in property rights. Thou shalt not steal. And you can steal through inflation. You can steal through taxation. But they have to start by focusing on class, race, and then move into gender and sexual orientation. And that's what they identify as what is valued. Now, I want to speak to BLM Inc., BLM Inc., not Black Lives Matter slogan, okay? I want to be very clear. And the African-American people in our church, you know, we've had conversations. We understand we're on the same page because they believe in kingdom culture trumps earthly culture. But here's, here's the naivety. When somebody is raising their hand or a pastor is raising their hand for BLM Inc., Here's the problem. And some of them do it out of ignorance. The co-founder of BLM, they're queer. Okay? Self-proclaimed queers. They said this. We are trained Marxists. Our efforts include fighting for transgenders and homosexuals. So if you're raising your hand in solidarity for BLM, Inc., that's really what you're supporting. And that, last I checked, is unbiblical. They said, we are fostering a queer-affirming network. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking. So what they've done was they took an important statement, and they have demonized it by perverting it with a false narrative. They literally, quote, unquote, we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear 
family structure. And what does that do? It literally breeds hostility towards Judeo-Christian beliefs about sexuality, about family, about parental authority and rights, about a husband's role and responsibility. See, they're trying to demonize men today. They're trying to disrupt the patriarchal uh, system that God has put in. And look, we, we as married people, Lori and I, we submit one to another, but ultimately I am going to be held accountable for the welfare of my household when I stand before God. But see, atheism and Marxism, which leads to hedonism, which means self-worship, provides no rationale for human worth or equity. None. Why? Because they're the indoctrinators of abortion, euthanasia, and genocide. And what they do is they move the lines to the whims of the dominant group. It's like this. Every dictator rose on the wings of free speech only to eradicate it once they became in power. This is why you cannot be a socialist or a Marxist or a communist and a Christian. You cannot be. I want to show you a quick video dealing with equal outcomes because equal outcomes is really a narrative that will disrupt the church. This is the goal, right? Jesus didn't come to build government. He said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. When he builds his church, it's kingdom government, which affects human government, earthly government, earthly structures. Okay? And so ultimately, they're out to destroy this, which means equal outcomes say, well, you need to have so many of ethnicity on your staff. You need to have so many of sexual gender or preference on your staff legally. And if you don't, you can lose your tax-exempt status, or if you don't, you can be held it fine, or you could be arrested. This is where it's going. This is where it is going. So let me, let me help you with the logic of equal outcomes, okay? So this is down at Florida State. Just a quick interview. I chopped it up a little bit. If you want the full link, we can throw it on the website. It's no problem. It's off YouTube. Check, check this out. Check this out. Maybe not. It's a really good video. What's going on? What? Oh, it's loading. Have you ever had that? So we're not alone. Well, wasn't that a good video? That was amazing. Wow. Praise God. Let me, let me just give you some ammunition Yes, there's racism, there's prejudiced people in America. I'm not denying that. And we can always do better. But listen, I'm going to read this statement. If we're going to demonize America's values by which it was founded on when we don't compare it to the rest of the world is a false measurement. It's a false balance. See, what they're trying to do is demonize America as though we are the worst nation on the planet. And I think we should go on a little trip. Right? So we can do some comparisons. Let's go to North Korea. Let's just let somebody stay there for a year or two or ten. Right? That, that think that America is so bad and so perverted. Let, let's go to China. Let's go to Tibet. Let's go to Nepal. Let's go to India. Let let me break out the social construct of Nepal. And let's compare this to America. Social construct. When you were born, you were born into a caste based on your lineage, your bloodline, your name. You were given that name, and that name then locks you into what you can do for work. So if you're born into the lowest caste, you can only do slave labor, menial tasks, move rocks, dig ditches, move dirt. That's it. That's why they sell their girls into sex trafficking. The next um, cast up is the Dalit. They're considered the untouchables. You're lower than animal excrement. You're not allowed to drink from the same water source. Has it improved a little bit? Yes, but still culture is still standing against improvement. 
When you're born into the Dalit caste, you can only be a jeweler, a tailor, or a brick maker. That is the only jobs that you can do. If you want, and we, we struggle with this right now because we are trying to rent better housing, bigger housing, but because of their caste and their last name, they won't do it. You want to see somebody get upset and want to rip the shingles off somebody's house? Okay? Because of name. Not because of, of payment history or anything. We, we got good credibility. We, we're not talking about that. We're just talking about your name. We're talking about that each caste has, the upper castes have their own languages. And they're not allowed to share their language with lower caste members. Why? Because we can protect what we want to talk about. These are the things that we're, this is systemic racism. Let me ask some questions regarding America. And these are questions that you can ask people when you're in conversation around the Christmas table. <laughs> let's equip. We're not here to argue. Let's talk. Let's, let's have a conversation. Okay? Because we shouldn't be afraid of a dissenting opinion. That's called freedom of speech. Like, if people want to comment on things that we're doing on Facebook, as long as they're not threatening and as long as it's not vulgar, they can disagree all they want, and we're not going to delete it. We'll just let it stand because I'm not afraid of an opposing thought to the truth. So here it is. What country would you rather live in than America? Let's talk about it. If America's so bad, what other country would you rather live in? Now, some people might say, oh, the Nordic states, the Nordic states, because they're the least racist. Guess what? 87.3% white people live in the Nordic states. So let's not talk about diversity in those states. All right? Because those are the talking points that they will throw at you. 87.3% white. They're very little, they have very little diversity. But what country would you rather live in? Why don't you move there? I will help you pack. Okay. Secondly, what specific opportunities do people not have in America? What opportunities is being held from you because of who you are? What specific laws and regulations are targeting you from succeeding? What are they? And what you're going to hear is cricket, cricket, tumbleweed, tumbleweed, because there are none. And according to the United Nations, check it out. If America is so broken and so racist, why is it still the most immigrated country in the world? $48.2 million immigrants in America. And the, the, the second closest is Russia with 11.6 because they like Putin with his shirt off. All right, let's take a look at this video. Check it out. Equal outcomes. 50% of students here are white. This is from 2019. 19% are Hispanic, 8% are Asian, and 5% are African American. If we were to apply that quota to the offensive lineup for the Florida Gators football team, this is what the lineup would look like. Okay, and that's probably not what it looks like at all. This is what yeah. it looks like right now. Yeah. Um, I feel like they're, just, they're probably just more skilled players because... Uh, I mean, I guess you could say, like, more skilled people should get into schools, too. Uh, I guess what I said could kind of be applied both. We'd probably be losing because we recruit, like, based on skill, and if we recruited based on diversity, then we'd probably be worse. I see nothing wrong with the current um, roster right now. I think, I think it's perfectly fine. If they're the best players fit for the job, then they deserve the spot. I mean, it'd definitely be different. When's the last time you saw a prominent Asian in football? Does this kind of change your mind about diversity quotas in other sectors, like the workplace, like college admissions? If we're talking about being the best in sports, um, shouldn't we also be talking about being the best in the workplace, being the best company, being the best college, the best university, regardless of anyone's race? Yeah, I think it was a good way to open your eyes and think, like, if you're recruiting athletes based on their skill level, maybe you should admit students based on 
their scores and their like academic merit more so than diversity. Yeah, a little bit because I just I didn't think about it being applied. I mean, I guess they are applied to schools, but not sports. And you could make a good argument for why uh, my reason for school would be the same for sports, basically. Yeah. See, it's it's just you got to talk people through it, right? Because when you talk about sports, you talk about Seahawks. You're like, no, I just I want the best players on the field, right? Even if they're on the sidelines, you're like, coach, put them in, put Russell in, right? That you want the best players on the field. But then if you try to take away that logic and that understanding, that reasoning from job skills, job sets, guess what? You're going to destroy America. Look, you can't be a child of God and promote CRT. You can't champion both movements. Again, just a quick scratch of the surface today, but, but I hope there's some things to help you think some things to help equip you so that you can be better informed and there are good resources out there. If you're looking for that, just let us know. Send us an email, a text or whatever, and we'll get you those resources to help equip you because our responsibility is the equipping of the saints so that you have confidence to go out and change this world for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Oh, so here's the deal. If you're not a child of God and you think you're a child of God, that's, that's a problem, okay? And there's a lot of people that they live in America and they think they're a child of God because they were christened as a baby, because grandma's on the prayer team, or maybe because just they attend church every now and then. They, Christmas Eve service, yeah, I'm, I'm going to heaven. Right? What a terrible false assumption. It's not enough to be 99% sure you're going to heaven because if that's the case, you're 100% wrong. Salvation is free, but I'm telling you, it will cost you everything. So this is what it looks like. He said, if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is your Lord, that's how you get saved. That's how you become born again. Not being a church attender. Look, you become a church attender. You become a tither. You become a server because you are born again. You don't do those things to get born again. Your works don't save you. Your efforts don't save you. But... Because you are saved, you have efforts and you have works that are producing into the kingdom of God. But here's what we do. We don't do the eyes closed, head bowed because, you know, Jesus said it this way. If you acknowledge me before other people, I acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. That's just the worship team. They're getting ready. If you deny me before others, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. But if you acknowledge me before others, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. So what we're going to do is, if you want to get born again, maybe for the first time, or you're like, dude, I want to be 100% sure, because I, I was 99, but that's not enough. I want to be 100% sure. I'm going to count to three, and if that's you, you're going to raise your hand like that, and we're going to celebrate. We're going to applaud the fact, because this is the best day of your life. Heaven says that all of heaven rejoices when one person gets born again. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to rejoice with you in your bold statement of saying, I want to be born again. And then what we're going to do, we're going to pray a prayer with those that are watching live on the internet as well. I'll say the words. You'll repeat them after me. Okay? That's how easy it is. So if you want to be born again, I'm going to count to three. You put your hand up. No reason to be ashamed. No reason to be bashful. Why? Because at some point, you got to take a stand. Might as well take a stand today. All right? Here it is. One, two, get ready. Three. Lift it up. Yes. Yes. Come on, anybody else in the balcony? Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, right on. Who else? Anyone else? You feel that, right? Woo! All right, pray with me. Heavenly Father, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin. I accept your son Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Live in me. As I live for you, in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Come on, stand and sing it today.